Hello, welcome to my video sample on the topic of purchasing and supply chain. Now I'm going to do something a little interesting here, a little, I should say a little unusual for me. I'm going to split this into two sections because I really need two boards because for supply chain a lot of it is taken up for one of my examples. So I'm going to splice this together. I'm going to start off with two videos. The first one's going to be uh, a little focused on supply chain. The second one will be more purchasing oriented. Um, I like to say when I start this that it's interesting how important uh, supply chain has become. My undergraduate degree is in industrial engineering, which is historically from manufacturing, and yet uh, I'm now on the board of my uh, pro undergraduate program. And when I go back, I realize how many people who used to be sort of on ma manufacturing track careers are now going into supply chain work. It's really the dominant thing uh, for uh, industrial engineering, which is sort of the study of efficiency, to, if you could summarize it. So this has really become a big issue uh, just in the sort of moderate time since I was at last in school. Um, and I would, uh, so with that in mind, let's get started a little bit. Let's start with the supply chain here. I have an example. And what I'm going to demonstrate here is what's called the bullwhip effect. This is my bullwhip example. And so let's say you have a supply chain where you have a factory and you have a distributor and the distributor sells to many retailers and the retailers sells to many customers. Now for the time being, let's just look above this line and I'm going to show you sort of a steady state initial conditions. So let's say for the sake of argument, you have customers who buy a hundred of these a week from a given retailer. And the retailer, so they're selling a hundred a week and they keep, let's say, 400 in inventory and they order a hundred a week to replace what they sold from the distributor each week. Now let's say a distributor has the same proportions but they sell to 10 retailers. So they have 4,000 in inventory. They sell uh, for each retailer 100, so that's 1,000 a week to the retailers. So they order 1,000 from the factory to replace what they've sold. And the factory probably sells to several distributors, but let's limit our example there. So let's assume we have a steady state here, week in, week out. Now what happens, let's say that there's a good review for whatever this product happens to be. So the sales all of a sudden double because of this good review. So uh, if you want to do a, a, be mathematical and call it a function, here's what the function looks like. Over time it immediately shifts up from 100 to 200. So now the customers are buying 200 a week. So you'll notice that they doubled their 2x times their original sales. But let's look at what happens at the retailer level. Well, the first thing is uh, they have now sold more than they were bringing in. So they brought in 100, they sold 200, which means they had to take 100 out of their inventory. So that goes down to 300. Now, what are they going to order from their distributor? Well, they, now that they're selling 200 a week, they have to order 200 plus the 100 required to uh, reinforce, re, uh, to, to re-up their inventory. So now they're ordering 300 a week. So they've gone from 100 a week to 300. So they've tripled what their requests are. Now let's say this happens at all retail locations. The distributor now, who has 4,000 inventory and was buying 1,000 a week to sell 1,000 a week, well now they have 10 retailers ordering 300 a week. So all of a sudden they're at 3,000 a week. Now how are they going to do that? They only brought in 1,000. So they're going to have to draw 2,000 out of inventory. So inventory drops from four to two, and they have to replace the 3,000 uh, th because they're now thinking that they're going to be selling 3,000 a week. So their order goes to 5,000 per week. And they, that means that they've gone from 1,000 to 5,000, and they've gone 5x for what they're going to order from the factory. So what you'll notice here is a doubling of demand at the customer level created a tripling at the retailer level, which created a quintupling at the distributor level. Uh, so that is what is called the bullwhip effect. It's kind of like a, a bullwhip. The way it works is the physical property of a bullwhip is it's like the, uh, the conservation of momentum, which is uh, mass times speed. So if your hand moves at the thick end at a certain speed and it moves down the whip, the uh, speed has to accelerate because the whip gets smaller and uh, the, the, as the mass decreases, the speed has to increase to make up for it. And at the end, that snap you hear at the end of a bullwhip is actually the very, very tip. It's so light that to conserve the momentum, it moves faster than the speed of sound. And that's what you hear is the snap of breaking the sound barrier. Obviously, your arm can't move at the speed of sound, but the, uh, but the bullwhip effect makes it so that uh, eventually the, the whip can. And so that's what sort of happens here is these increase as you go uh, a change 
uh, ripples and increases in magnitude as you go further back the supply chain. Now, is it necessarily two times, three times, five times? Not at all. That's just because of the example I made up and the numbers I used. Um, but uh, there's a couple things to bear in mind here. First of all, the, uh, I've given it a pretty big shock. I've been a doubled, doubled the demand. It might just go up 10%, uh, but the same concept would apply. You know, you'd see increases as you go further back the supply chain. Also, this is largely driven in my example by inventory replenishment. But there are other things that can uh, cause and exacerbate the bullwhip effect as well. And so let's talk about a few of them. The first one to talk about is a lag time. If there's a, you know, we've sort of said that every week they order and get replenished, but if there's a lag in either how often they order, like order frequency, so if they take a while to order, and if there's a transit time where it takes a while to reach them, they're gonna have to be chewing through that inventory until they get their next order, which means the next order has to be even more. So a lag time can exacerbate the bullwhip effect. Also, they have to know if this shift is going to last. And in my example, I've made it such that everyone uh, believes that uh, what they ordered is, what the, what the order of the last week was is the next week's order. Now the reality is, um, some of these things, like uh, here at the distributor level, this 3,000 was to replace some inventory as well. So they, that might actually drop down just to the replacement rate of 200 times 10, 2,000. So it'll actually ripple a little bit. And what that does is a couple of things. Um, they might not adjust their inventory, they might not adjust things uh, as quickly if they are not certain that the results will last. So the factory isn't necessarily going to start adding shifts if they don't know if this is just a one-time aberrant event. Also, the, uh, I've kept the inventory level constant even though demand went up, so they had 400 when they were selling 100. Now that they're selling 200, they might want to make four weeks inventory if it's set on the number of weeks that they hold on hand, that'll go to 800. And that will create some uh, even larger swings, such as uh, this, this 200 order. Uh, that they were going to have to replace. Well, the, the inventory replacement will no longer be 100. It'll have to go from 400 to down to 300, but then up to 800. So the 800 minus 300 is 500 plus the 200 they were selling. So now all of a sudden they're ordering 700, which is a 7x move. So that's my next point is that the inventory, uh, if the inventory were based on sales, that would actually exacerbate my inventory effect here. And the last point I want to make here on complications, this is actually sort of the response to that. You'll notice that, uh, you know, despite all that we hear about lean inventory, more inventory actually helps in this scenario. Because if, you know, instead of 400, they had, say, 10,000 or a million units, then this blip that they have, this extra 100 units, wouldn't be that significant, and they might not want to order so quickly to replace it. And it's so, uh, but there's a couple caveats there. One of them is the inventory has to be available. If the inventory is in transit, if it's on a truck going to the retailer or the factory to the distributor, it's work in, it's in process, it's inventory, but they're not, they can't use it. It has to be actually at the retail level to sell it to the customers or at the distributor to sell it to the retailer. If it's on its way there, that doesn't count. Also, um, it, you'll notice that because of the bullwhip, you need, you, the shock increases in magnitude the further back the supply chain, you need more inventory. If you sort of had, where would I put the extra inventory in the system? I'd want to put it as far back as possible to absorb the shocks where they're most pronounced. And, but, so more inventory helps in an increase in sales, but you remember, inventory has its own cost. It's not a panacea. It's got capital costs. You've got more capital tied up when you have inventory. Also, the more inventory in the system, the more spoilage you have. And then finally, the, uh, you know, if, if you have a quality problem at the factory that you don't see until it gets to the customers and they start using them and things start failing, now because you have more inventory in the system, it's more expensive. You have more, more things that you're going to have to potentially scrap or rework. Now with that in mind, let's talk about some options that we can use to mitigate these things. The first one is you can share information. So for example, the, the factory would be more comfortable knowing, uh, investing in extra shifts if they knew what this was, if they knew what the change was at the customer level. All they know is that they've had a dramatic increase at the distributor level demand 
orders, but they don't necessarily know why. And so you can, uh, first of all, you can share that information. You can have uh, factories checking with retailers to see what the sell through is. And you can also have, um, you, you can also have communications between them. So if, if, you, if the factory says, look, I can't go up five times, uh, I don't have that much capacity, but let's start rationing. Who really needs it? You know, we can worry about the input. First, we have to get the sell through. We can worry about restocking inventories later. So the closer the coordination of your supply chain, um, the better. And the most extreme form of this is what's called vendor managed inventory, which means that the, the vendors are actually have a person who restocks the retailers as they run out. You can see this sometimes at grocery stores, you'll see someone restocking the Coke or the Pepsi, and you'll realize that they're not wearing a badge at the store. They're a vendor managing the inventory. And that means they get perfect information because they're the ones actually doing it. Um, I've also seen this at certain uh, department stores. I, went, I, was in a Thai, I was in the Thai department of a, of a department store once and there was a lady there um, putting out stock and I asked her a question. She goes, I don't actually work here, I'm a vendor. So she was doing that. She was vendor managing the inventory. Um, also, that works better in mature markets because you've got uh, more, uh, the retailers are consolidated. So for example, when I used to sell into retail um, in the United States, we had a handful of retailers, you know, Walmarts and Best Buys, depending on what you're selling, that had very good uh, information sharing because their systems were very advanced. But when our, in our European division, uh, those were more fragmented by country and they didn't have all the investment in the information, so it was harder to get. And another option you have is uh, you can effectively raise price because that will cool the demand. And if you can't get the supply, you can, you can make more money by restricting, the, uh, restricting demand by raising the price. Now the problem there is you can get into a backlash. And one of the issues that uh, we had in the auto industry is that the dealers would want to raise price, but that would sometimes turn off some of the other customers saying that your products are really expensive. Now this was a, di uh, a difference of opinion between the dealer and the manufacturer because the dealer is the one who gets all the money. The manufacturer doesn't get a benefit from the raised price. They're still wholesaling at the same price, but they do suffer from the backlash against their brand. So that becomes really tense uh, when the retailer, uh, essentially the dealer, would get into a fight with the um, manufacturer. The last thing I want to talk about here is um, some other, oh, I shouldn't say the other, I'm not quite finished yet. Second to last is some of the other scenarios. I've given you a discrete step function here. Uh, it can also be linear, which means you're going to have an accelerating problem every week, or more likely it can just be all over the map. Remember at the, at the first week that they see this go up, they don't necessarily know that that's sustainable. So they might hesitate to, uh, order more and that's going to create more lag time if they find out it is sustainable. For all they know it was just a one-time spike or something special. Also it's important to note that we can have declining, unfortunately, declining sales which would be the opposite of this and in that case inventory is actually bad because they have to shut down the factory until they work all of the inventory in the system back down. So inventory can help in an increase in sales but it's harmful in a decrease and there's a lot of, uh, I have a friend who has a theory about the economy he says that we're actually uh, have an easier time working through recessions, not necessarily the one we're in at the time of this recording, but if you look at recessions in the early 90s and the early 2000s, um, they were relatively easy. And his theory was that the supply chains are so lean now that the inventory, uh, you know, even, even if sales drops, you don't have to shut down all of your factories or shut them down for as long to get your inventory levels back down because there's less inventory in the system. So you can, uh, the factory, which would cause the recession, the layoffs, uh, is more mitigated. And the last point I want to make in other scenarios is we've talked about demand changes here, but you also have, uh, you can also have supply issues. Like if you have, your factory is hit by a tsunami or an earthquake or a tornado or something or, or uh, something goes wrong, you have um, an issue with, uh, rather than demand, your supply changes. And what happens is these people have to live off of their inventory longer. And then when the factory gets fixed and comes back online, it's going to have a similar effect. Big orders because they've had maybe several weeks of, not, of living off of inventory, so they have to replenish their inventory as well. And I just want to mention a couple other things here on this example, and then I'll do the new board. Um, the first one is, it's important to remember you're planning your capacity. One of the key issues here, if you have a factory, 
is that you know you set up the factory especially mass production and efficient operations you set it up for a certain volume you can't quintuple it usually uh, uh, overnight and so it's really important to get that right this is this bullwhip effect is one of the reasons it's so hard you know when they find out that a toy is a hit you still can't get it at the holidays because the factory just doesn't have the capacity to produce more and uh, that's one of the reasons that forecasting becomes so important and uh, why you know if a car is a hit model they still can't seem to get enough of them made because of how the factory was set up. And the last one I just I've already sort of alluded to, just in time. The just in time is the idea that you drop inventory to find out where your problems are so you can fix it, so you can run lean and minimize your cost and spoilage and scrap, but it does have some issues in that it is less flexible to this volatility. So with that in mind, I'm gonna stop this video and I'll go to my next one. The first thing I wanna talk about is if you look at the is, uh, decisions about outsourcing. And classically, there's a finance model that you use. You'll learn this in your first finance class. I, I teach it in some of my finance stuff. Uh, it's, it's the uh, make versus buy decision, which is sort of an outsourcing decision. And oftentimes, if it's a product, there's sort of a, uh, if you're buying it from someone, you know, let's say it's $10 a unit. So as your volume goes up, your total cost goes up proportionally. It's a straight line. Um, the, uh, the, whereas when you make it, you can usually make it on a lower cost per unit the variable basis because uh, uh, they're charging you a premium when you buy it but you do have to have the fixed cost of building the factory and the infrastructure to do it yourself so it starts at a higher level and the theory is when you're in this area the make line is more expensive than the buy so you would want to buy but as you get to a certain point this is called the break-even point buying becomes more expensive and you would want to make it so if your volume is high enough uh, past the break-even you want to make it but I, you know, even though this is oftentimes used, I like to think of a lot more uh, considerations that I think are important. A lot of companies make mistakes. The first one is if you are having, if you are buying it, if you hire someone to make it for you, you are oftentimes training your competition. You're sharing information with them. Now they're in the habit of making it. You're not. They can start supplying your competitors or they can go into the business themselves. So that's a strategic implication. The other one is the option value. I have a friend of mine from uh, undergraduate who works in supply chain and she worked for a big company and they were uh, had hired someone to make some of their product for them. They were buying it essentially. And I said, that doesn't make sense. You've got uh, a lot of uh, capacity in your own company and uh, you, know, you, you make a lot of products, you have pretty good volume. She, and what she said to me was, well, look, what's happening is we're going into new markets, emerging markets, and yes, we expect them to be big, but we don't know exactly where. So we're gonna buy it and, and penetrate the market by buying and then once we figure out where the volume is and what the volume is, we're going to make the factory that will make it uh, and, and we'll know exactly where to put it for the least transportation cost it, because we'll put it wherever the most volume is and we will, um, uh, we'll also know exactly what capacity to set it for. So they're buying to preserve their option value, you know, I might put it here, the option of having putting it here versus there, whereas once you build it, um, it's expensive to, and redundant to, to build it somewhere else or change it. You have to live with your decisions. Um, another thing you want to consider is the, the fact that you might lose the capability if you outsource it. Uh, you know, you think, well, if it, if it goes bad, we can bring it back. But oftentimes that's building up that an internal capability that you have at, as of now is uh, not really, it's not really practical to go back and, and uh, rebuild that capability. It might be too expensive. So sometimes once you lose it, you've lost it for good. And that, that, again, decreases your option value. Um, the other thing is a lot of people will bid work now to get the, uh, sort of gain the capability and wait for you to lose the capability. And then once they have it, they'll raise the price later. So uh, low pr you know, condi pricing conditions can change over time. Another thing is they might raise the price at the change. A lot of suppliers will bid work at a low price to get the work. And then if you're designing something complicated, we deal with this a lot in the car industry, as design changes come down, they say, well, now we've already bought our equipment for that, so now we have to charge you more if you want to change it. Or construction projects work like this a, a lot. And so as a result, they'll, they'll lose money at the original price to get the business. And then with the anticipation, almost certain anticipation of changes, they will raise the price. And one, another issue that you ought to consider when outsourcing is how much office politics are coming into play. I once worked in a marketing department who tried to outsource our engineering capacity because when the engineering capacity was in the, in the company, he had to sort of negotiate with engineering everything. But if he could work around them by going outside and outsourcing that capability, 
he could uh, control it all himself. Sort of like they answered to him, whereas inside the company, uh, it was an equal head that he had to negotiate with. And the last one is labor. Sometimes making versus buying is not just a cost decision, but what, it, what are you doing with your, uh, in terms of empowering your labor force? Uh, and this is, uh, depends, you know, it's uh, on, on your relationship with your labor force. Uh, if, it, if you have a positive relationship, it'll make you want to uh, do more internally. If you have a negative relationship, it would make you want to, if you have a contentious relationship, so, shall we say, and assuming you can't fix it, which is always the easiest answer, uh, then, then outsourcing becomes more appealing. The auto industry ran into this problem. In the early 1900s, it was really popular for the American auto industry to vertically integrate. They didn't want to just make the car, they wanted to make the parts and they wanted to own the rubber field, the, the rubber plantations and all of that. And what happens is the, they unionized uh, and the unions charged uh, more rates, uh, higher wages and health care benefits and things like that. And so they r ran into the problem of now they had to try and outsource the work and they tried to spin off those groups because it became unsustainable. Their vertical integration actually worked against them when the labor movement of the, say, 40s uh, took over the industry. The next, so those are some outsourcing considerations, more strategic. You also want to bear in mind some of your incentives that your people have. So for example, your purchasing department is oftentimes judged on cost. Uh, but the problem is they might not be judged on responsiveness. So you've got to bear all of those things in mind or they will outsource it to the cheapest company uh, that might not be able to meet uh, the demands of the, your manufacturing process. Also, engineering is oftentimes judged on performance. So they want to make you know, specialized parts that are, that are just as light as they can be, but they, they don't have any more or any less, whereas standard off the parts off-the-shelf parts might uh, diminish the performance a little bit, but it, they might be more, they might be lower cost, and they might also be less complex, and it's easier to uh, acquire and, and store uh, standard replacement parts. So engineering might be judged on performance, not cost or complexity, and then manufacturing is generally judged on cost, not necessarily of the parts, because sometimes that comes from another group, that comes from purchasing or something, but the cost of their own manufacturing operation and they're very concerned with responsiveness. Downtime is very expensive for them. They really get the heat when there's, a, when there's a problem with the supplier. So these guys might be more interested in responsiveness than the purchasing department will be because these guys have neglected the cost of downtime. They're, the cost they're usually judged on is the price of acquisition. And you'll notice here, my concern is that who here is in charge of the strategic implications, like making sure that we're not training our competition, making sure that information isn't shared, that we, our intellectual property is protected. Those are more long-term, and most of these managers have short-term goals like cost, performance, uh, responsiveness. And so str strategy, which is arguably the most important, nobody is actually in charge of. So these are some really important and perverse incentives that you want to uh, make sure you're managing around. The next thing I want to talk about is some of the decisions that you're going to have to make. There's a lot of trade-offs in supply chain management and purchasing, but you just want to make sure you're making them conscious, make sure you're aware of them so that you're making them consciously. One of them is uh, efficiency versus redundancy. It makes sense to have two factories building something, so if a tornado hits one, the other one can continue to operate. The problem is you, you, you lose scale efficiency because having a bunch, you know, usually you, having one place is uh, less expensive than having uh, a two because you have economies of scale there. So that's a decision you have to make. Um, another one is scale versus responsiveness. So for example, if I have all of my uh, purchase, all of my manufacturing in one factory supply a bunch of different places, I get economies of scale, but I can't necessarily, you know, now if I'm a global company and I'm shipping product all over the globe, uh, there's a lot of in-transit time. And first of all, you want to bear in mind the cost of transit because that might outweigh your scale cost and also it can't be respond to the market as quickly if you have a quality problem you've got a longer supply chain so it might make sense to keep one plant in each continent the next decision you're going to have to make is how many suppliers do you want and, and this is sort of a, a creating value versus capturing value negotiation you want uh, the, the the fewer suppliers will give you better scale they'll actually be able to produce it cheaper because they have a larger uh, operation and they get economies of scale, but because you, that you want comp enough competition to where the cost savings accrues to you, not the supplier, because the the supplier is um, uh, the supplier 
might have low cost, but if they know they're the only supplier, they can raise the price on you, as we talked about earlier. And you know, I should, be, I should state for the record here, I'm talking about these things like you're the one doing the purchasing, but if you're on the other side of these equations, you could view it the opposite way. So if you're a supplier, you might wanna say, look, give us all of your business and we'll do it cheaper, and that way you can avoid competition in the long term. And the last one I wanna talk about, revisit a little bit here, we talked already about information sharing. The advantage of information sharing is that if you work very collaboratively and closely with a few close suppliers, you can oftentimes improve your design. They might say, look, you asked us to develop a part that works like this, uh, but if you make a slight change, it'll be cheaper. And one of the things that Chrysler Corporation has is a score program. I had a friend who used to work in their purchasing department, and he would say what they would do is they would say, look, if you as a supplier come to us Chrysler with a design change that doesn't hurt the performance but makes it cheaper for you to build, we will approve that design change and you and I will split the cost savings of that. So that was cooperative. But remember, you want to, you know, there's a cooperation versus competition thing. They might not be willing to do that if you're playing them off of their competitors. Also, um, you can, through information sharing, and I should point out this is in addition to the supply chain information sharing from my previous video where I showed about you know, sell through uh, sales and orders. Um, the, but another thing of information sharing is you can decrease the total cost of your uh, product. Now if you're a supplier, there are some negatives here. If you're a supplier, one of them, if you're sharing information with the, with the people you're selling to, they might take that information and learn your process and then train someone else to do it or do it themselves. So you might be training your replacement there. You also have the, the concern that they will, they will learn what the cost you're actually dealing with and if you're making a lot of money, they'll try and haggle you down on price because they'll see that there's windfall because you've let them in to your um, facilities. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about under decisions, uh, I should say under information sharing, if, if, this is the, if you're a supplier, if you're the purchasing company, the negatives are, again, you might be training your competition. You, they might have bid low to learn how to do it, so now they can supply your competitors or, your, um, uh, the, or, or go into the business themselves. And the last thing is oftentimes you lose your intellectual property by sharing it. Oftentimes in the auto industry, the confirmation of the rumor mills about what projects they're working on, those leaks come from suppliers, not necessarily the company themselves because the suppliers are less, um, uh, the, the suppliers might be a little bit more comfortable sharing that information, leaking that information. They're not as tightly, con it's harder to herd a group of varying businesses than to keep it all in house. And the last thing I should also talk about, uh, I didn't put this up here, but decisions is, um, do you wanna share your suppliers with your competitors or not? And the, the reason that is, well, it's kind of a scale uh, issue if, but versus competitive advantage. If you have a lot of if you, if you as an industry have fewer suppliers, you're sharing them with another company, they might, um, uh, th th you both get the benefit of the economies of scale, but now you're using the same parts and your products are less differentiated. Um, in the auto industry, they try and uh, keep, uh, usually like for example, the seat manufacturers in the auto industry, there's two major seat makers and they, want, they wanted two to keep them in competition, but they share them uh, to keep them in, uh, to, uh, to, to give them a scale that they can then, um, have some cost savings with. And the interesting thing is when uh, General Motors and Chrysler were threatened with bankruptcy and the, the government had to bail them out, Ford was actually a big advocate of that because Ford shared a lot of the suppliers with them and Ford said, look, if these companies go bankrupt, uh, you know, two thirds of our supplier's business goes away and they'll go bankrupt and that'll affect even us as a, as a company that doesn't need bankruptcy itself necessarily. So these things can ripple. There's a lot of decisions to be made. Um, and then I just got a few other things I wanna mention. Uh, one of them is some of the tactics you can use when you're purchasing. So for when I was in the printer business, we would get into reverse auctions, which is where the purchaser would say, who is willing to uh, give us the lowest price? And then one person would go lower and then we'd constantly go down on pricing. We didn't particularly care for that since I was the one selling into those reverse auctions. Also, you can have some additional incentive problems. We talked about strategic, but you can also have the uh, issue where um, people, nobody gets fired for buying IBM is the old expression, which means um, people tend to w want to buy the best known brand because it's a career risk for them to take a chance on someone even if they're a lower cost because it, even, if, even if IBM and a generic computer had the same breakdown, if IBM breaks down, 
the defense will always be, hey, look, we bought the best, that's what happened. So the, uh, the conclusion will be these products break down. But if you buy a non obvm and it breaks down, same amount of breakdowns, people will say, well, that's because you're a terrible purchasing manager, you should have bought the IBM. So that's a problem in balancing your uh, uh, cost uh, with uh, your, your risk with your cost. And you want to make sure that your um, purchasing agents are properly incented to push the boundaries uh, but, uh, and, and uh, not get caught into paying too much just to be safe. The, another incentive problem is you have the uh, easier to, uh, uh, you, you can have a purchasing agent who's easier to manage in than out. So if it's easier for them to get their, in, their own company to raise what they pay than it is to get the supplier to lower their price, they will start lobbying the other way around. Instead of trying to get a pr uh, supplier to pay, to charge less, they'll try and get their company to pay more. And that's not in the company's interest. You can also run into the blame game when you get into responsiveness. And uh, you know, there's a problem with a part. Uh, the, the supplier will always claim that it was fine when it got to your factory and your factory messed it up. And your factory will always claim the supplier, it was bad when the supplier sent it. And those are hard to uh, uh, sort out. And then the last point I want to make is a little bit more uh, supply chain. Uh, the difference between selling in and selling out. There's a channel effectively in your supply chain. And uh, if you're selling into it, you might have the uh, channel stuffing incentive. If your sales force gets a bonus at the end of the month, they might try and ship a bunch of, give great deals to ship into the channel at the end of the month. But then now the channel has been stuffed. And so at the next quarter, it, sales are going to be really slow right after that benchmark. That's called channel stuffing. The other one is pantry loading. If you want to get um, enough sell through, uh, sell in is sort of like when you as a manufacturer sell into the channel. Sell, sell out is when the channel sells to the end customer. Um, and the pantry load is when they, do the, uh, they try and do the same thing at the customer level. They want to get the customers to, uh, they give customers a great deal to make their sales goal, but then customers buy more than they need and they just set it in inventory and wait. Um, so you want to make sure you know the difference between sell in and sell out and selling it, uh, sell out also called sell through. Uh, so with that in mind, that is, uh, that concludes my presentation on purchasing and supply chain. I hope you found this of interest. If you'd like something like this presented at your organization or event, please contact me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.